Hello, everyone, and welcome to the weekly Mind of Leap webinars on how to prepare for F1. Um, tonight, the session is going to be led by myself and Dr. Ben Turner, and we're going to give you some top tips for medical and surgical FY1s that we have, um, have guarded over this year because we are just about to finish F1. Um, before we start, uh, just a quick shout out to the MDU, who's our sponsor. Don't forget to sign up to sort out your indemnity cover for this year because your student membership is going to expire. We're going to post the link in the comment section. Um, additionally, please feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, just post them in the comment section. And then if you remember questions later, we can always ask them at the end. And then you can always send us um, any questions via the um, Mind of Leap Facebook page. Um, all, is there anything else I need to mention? I think this is the most important uh, important information before we start. As, We're not just saying that because it's our presentation either, as, but these are real life tips. Samsung is going to help with, uh, with the Q&A at the end. And we're also going to post the link for you to sign up for any future webinars so you don't miss anything. And uh, just a reminder that all the content is recorded so you can access it later. And you will also be emailed the slides if you sign up for the webinars. So we'll post all the links in the, in the comment section. Um, and all of this will be available available to you. And please, please feel free to ask as many questions as you want, because if you're about to start F1, you want to know the answer tonight. It's a scary time, it's scary time. <laughs> all right, so I'll just hand over to Ben. Hi guys, so we thought we'd just uh, kick it off with how you're gonna be feeling right now. And don't worry, you're gonna feel anxious. Not only are you meeting a new team on the wards, you're actually doing a job that effectively you've never done before. Um, but don't worry too much about that job because you're not gonna be jumping straight in at A to E. You're actually gonna be typing and scribing everything your consultant and reg says. And for that reason, it's actually really important to be organized, be reliable, and make sure you understand everything that they're saying, okay? Um, if you're unsure about something, it's a bit of a question of where to start. But one of the things we'd really recommend is speaking to your SHOs because these are the guys that have done the job for at least one year already. They're probably going to have worked in the center or a similar center to you. And they're going to be able to give you all the top tips on how to order the scans, how to make those referrals, where to find this, who to ask, what team to refer to. Um, and you're gonna need all of that over the coming year for sure. Throughout everything, just remember that all you're trying to do is deliver good patient care. And so if things are frustrating, people are being mean to you, uh, something goes wrong, just remember, keep the patient safe, the patient comes first. And if you do that, you're not gonna run into any trouble. Just always put the patient first. All right, so we're just going to uh, let you know what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to give you some top tips on what to do when you arrive to the ward, how to survive a ward round. Um, we're going to talk a bit about the ward jobs that you will have to do probably most days. Um, discharge summaries and TTAs, which will be your bread and butter. Um, how to do an effective handover some tips for being on call, uh, what to do to get the most out of your shadowing period and some tips for the surgical rotation. So there's plenty to, to go through. So we're going to crack on. Okay, so arriving on the ward first thing in the morning, you can make such a huge difference to people's days and you'll be really surprised at this. If you're the chirpy one who comes in and gives everyone a big friendly hello, you, you set the tone for the entire day you can get on with all the nursing staff, make sure you introduce yourself, say hello to anyone. Um, and then it's important to check whether there was anything that happened overnight. So there might've been medical issues, there might've been nursing issues, a patient might have become confused. There may have been uh, a call out or even a medical emergency overnight. So it's important that you as the first medical person who's arriving there at the start of the day, does this little check with the team, see how everyone's doing, introduce yourself and start building this good rapport. 
it's important to uh, ask the nurses because they normally have their hand over around seven o'clock or seven thirty. So they are actually going to be the first port of call and will know what happened overnight. You can then go and check the notes and and take away from that what you will. Grab a computer, grab a coffee, and start prepping those notes because, especially if you're on a paper system, it can take some serious time. So surviving the ward round itself, this can be uh, this can be quite an arduous task at times. Medical ward rounds will start at around nine o'clock and may well run until one or even two o'clock. <laughs> I'm so sorry to tell you if you didn't already know this, but especially the Jerry's ward rounds, they can be really long. Um, surgical ward rounds, you might be done by nine, nine thirty. It's much better. The important thing is to be polite to the consultant, be punctual. If you're not there on time for the start of the ward round, they'll be very cross with you uh, and be fast. You need to learn how to document efficiently. And we've sort of come up with a, a suggested method that's quite a, a tried and tested one across hospitals that we'll go through in a minute. Um, if there's something you haven't heard or, or don't understand on the ward round, make sure you clarify it with the consultant. Because if they come back the next day and ask you about it and you don't have a response, that's going to be a bit tricky to defend. And similarly, it, the consultant might go, okay, start a pixaban for the patient. And if you know the dose, that is a, a very quick and easy job. But if it's not, then you have to come back later. You have to find the drug chart. You have to look it up in the BNF. So try to have some of those doses of common drugs like antibiotics, anticoagulants with you to hand so you know exactly what you're doing going in. You should, in theory, never be by yourself as a junior. There should be other juniors there with you and you can, you can handle the jobs by acting, working together as a team so that you say one person's preparing notes while the other person's going into the room with the previous patient and the consultant and documenting for them. You can keep one big jobs list all together so that once you get to the end of the ward round, you don't have to go back through and look at the notes because that takes a significant amount of extra time. So we thought we'd just walk you through a, a mock-up of a ward round and we've both done the endocrine job at our hospital. Uh, and so we've got say a, an endocrine ward round, prime example here from a, a Dr. Smith. And you can see we've put the title of the ward round at the, at the top, Dr. Smith, and we put in brackets that he's a consultant. So, you would also put a date and time, which is very important for the medical legal issues. So always put a date and time. On every single page that you ever write on. On the computers, this isn't so much of an issue, but on paper, it very much is. So we've got a 27-year-old lady. We've, we've used all the abbreviations so that you can see and incorporate them to save yourselves time. She's admitted with abdo pain, nausea and vomiting. That's the date she was admitted, so we can see how long she's been in hospital for. And we've got her background there of type one diabetes. Then you move on to the current issues of the, of the patient's stay in hospital. So you can see that we're treating her for number one, diabetic ketoacidosis. And th those were her admission statistics. Uh, we can see we treated her with a fixed rate insulin infusion at five units an hour. And we've managed to resolve the acidosis there. So the ketones have come down the bicarbs come up. We've also put an HbA1c there and that's useful for understanding how good this lady's diabetes control might be over time. So you're just trying to make it so that if someone's flicking back through the notes, they can understand really easily what the issues are with the patient and if something acute has happened, how they might, uh, how they might interpret those in, in light of the patient's new issue. So second, we're treating her for sepsis and we've put the, the white blood cell count and the CRP as the inflammatory markers there. And we've also put a bit about the uh, antibiotics and the investigations they've had. Now the antibiotics are really useful to have on there because if the patient starts spiking again and the team comes in the middle of the night, it's not gonna be useful to give them the same antibiotics again because you know the patient's spiking on those. So the team will be able to escalate the antibiotics and they'll be able to see how long the patient's been on them for. And then third, we just put that the, this lady's got an AKI as well. 
So that's your first part of the ward round documentation. Then you always put the news score and if they're using two, you might want to put what that news, news score of two is for. So the, the tachycardia there and the slightly low blood pressure and we've got the rest of the obs. And then if you've got time, it's really good to put the important bloods in. Uh, and put, so we, you can see here that we put urea 3.7 and then in brackets it's 8.2. That is uh, an accepted way of documenting that on these bloods, the urea is 3.7 and on the previous day's bloods, it was 8.2 or on the last result that you've got on the system, it was 8.2. And similarly with the creatinine there, and we can see that this is also showing that the CRP is coming down as well. Then you have your review part. So you start writing as the consultant is going through. How do you feel, Miss James? Oh, I'm feeling okay. My, my tummy pain is getting a bit better. I still have a bit of stinging when I go to the loo. You're, you're documenting this in a, in a medical way into the notes. Um, and we can see there, they're just talking through the history. You basically just have to write down what the consultant is asking the patient. Um, and we can see there that she's a bit stressed. So she hasn't been checking her blood sugar and then she got some vomiting and that's probably, and then she stopped taking her insulin. So she probably got DKA from that. And sometimes you have to be very quick when you do that because the consultants go through things very quickly. Uh, so you finish up the ward round documentation by saying that your impression overall is, so it's here, it's number one, it, it's diabetic ketoacidosis, and that's because she missed insulin doses. Uh, she's also got some neurosepsis and she's got an AKI because of dehydration. So then you have to document the plan, which is gonna be all these things here in this case, make sure you document every point. And when you come out of the room, just just run the plan past the consultant, especially right at the start. So say, okay, Dr. Smith, are you happy with this? So we're gonna chase the urine culture. We're gonna continue Kermoxiclav for today, IV. Uh, we'll get the diabetes nurse to come and do the insulin education. We'll move over to variable rate. And then hopefully tomorrow we can aim home. I'll start doing the discharge summary. That's a perfect little summary. And make sure you haven't missed anything. And then you must finish by saying your name, your position and leave your bleep number so that you can be contacted. I'd also say that, um, especially at the beginning, things can be very confusing and wrapping your head around what has happened to the patient, why they got the treatment that they, um, they were offered is a bit tricky. So the impression part of the notes writing for me was one of the most important things because this gives you the opportunity to clarify with the consultant what they actually think has happened. Um, so I can't stress enough that when you're writing your um, discharge, when you're writing your um, ward uh, round entry, just make sure you ask the consultant by the impression because that will help you just arrange everything in your head and then the plan will make much more sense. Okay, on to a little bit about referrals. So especially at the start, you won't be expected to refer to specialties. However, over time, people will forget quite quickly that you're the new kid on the block and they'll just start handing you referrals to do. And I, I can, I really empathize because I found referrals so scary at the start. And I think it, it's a very natural thing because you're the new F1 on the ward and you're referring to a, a reg. They might be an SC7, SC8 reg, nearly a consultant. And you're there like, uh, hello, uh, um, my consultant told me. I'd always say, uh, uh, I'm a new F1. <laughs> Hi, I'm a new F1. <laughs> it's really scary, guys. So the, you've all going to have heard of SBAR before, but it, it's really important to remember before you even get to your S part, make sure you sit down with everything there. It, it's so useful. Get the drug chart, get the OBS, make sure you have the bloods up in front of you and get the patient notes. That way, when they ask you like, okay, and what's the blood pressure? You don't have to go, uh, I'm really sorry. Can I just go and get that? And they go, <sighs> no, but also if it does happen, the useful thing is if you start realizing they don't have the crucial information you're already on the phone with somebody you want to refer to just try to calm down ask them exactly what information they need and give them a call back so that's your um plan b that's a great get out of jail card okay um so we got here yeah so get all that stuff together and then if re if rejected just politely ask for their name uh what, what further information they need and then 
basically just go and talk to your reg and they'll do it for you. <laughs> so here's the, the short example. Um, when you're when you need to convey information in a time critical manner, I'm sure everyone is aware um, of the SBAR format. So we're starting with a situation. So you have to quickly introduce yourself. So in here, the example is that I'm introducing myself as Sarah, the FY1 on AMU, um, which is the acute medical unit. Um, I'm calling to refer a patient for a possible STEMI um, for consideration of PCI. Then we have to give a bit of a background information on the patient. Um, so that's most likely going to be what they presented with, how old they are, um, what has happened and what are um, some of their investigations and observation results. Um, so in here, we have a 44 year old male who has a cardiac sounding chest pain, started at 4 a.m., but it's not improved with, with the GTN. They also have acute pulmonary edema. Um, on ECG, they have anterior ST elevation and a troponin of 2,100. They had cabbage last year. They have diabetes type two and hypertension. Then um, you have to provide your assessment. So in this situation, I believe that this patient is having a STEMI and the recommendation. So what I actually want from the patient who's on the other side of the phone is uh, to review the patient for a PCI. So that's just a, if you need something, um, yeah, if it's time pressure, I need to convey just the most important information. It's quite a useful um, heading to use. Um, so some of us are actually running a project on referrals at the moment because uh, we may have been at, at the uh, receiving end of some serious beration from seniors. Um, and it, it is a really scary thing to do. Uh, so on Mind the Bleep, we've actually generated a referrals cheat sheet. And it has general stuff about referring to medical or surgical specialties, but it also has uh, specific examples for each specialty. Uh, and I'd encourage you to go and use this cheat sheet on Mind Bleep because it's super useful basically and can save you a lot of uh, embarrassment and fear, uh, stuff like that. And um, if you do use this cheat sheet and you like it or you have some feedback for us, it'd be super useful to hear about it and you can just use this um, Google Forms that we've popped at the bottom of the page here. On to another especially scary part of the FY1, which is going and facing the radiologist. So getting scans falls into two parts, really. It's booking the scan online, and then depending on the nature of the scan, like CT, ultrasound, MRI, those kind of things, they'll need to be vetted by a radiologist who basically will read the information you've given online uh, and they can be quite fierce creatures who will <laughs> deny your scan. So it's really useful to have some tips going into this situation before you're put on the back foot, because what will happen, say you're on surgery, the consultant in the morning will come around, he'll fill the tummy, say the patient's two days post-op and he'll go, get a CT. And they won't tell you what for. They so won't tell this you. is when you have to ask. They won't tell you anything. So at this point, the, this is the best point to ask, like, Sorry, Mr. So-and-so, uh, a, a CT, what kind of CT? And normally it'll be a CT abdo pelvis with yeah, contrast, but, exactly. but you must clarify. And then the next thing to do is ask them what you're looking for, because they just go CT. Now, the, you'll have to do this a few times before you start getting it right. And when you inevitably go to radiology and they say, okay, you've given me all this detail and you'll fill in a lovely thing. This is a 37 year old man. He's admitted with appendicitis. He had an operation. His CRP is uh, like middling at 70. CT abdo pelvis, please. And you'll go down there because it hasn't been vetted. And you'll say, um, sorry, can we get the CT vetted? And they'll go, uh, yeah, what are, you, what are you looking for with the scan? And you'll stand there like, <laughs> I, I have no idea. Um, so you, you, must, you must check with them. And when you go down there, it's actually a really good op learning opportunity. If you say, listen, I'm a new F1, I'm interested in radiology. Well, tell me, what, what do we normally look for with this scan? Uh, and why is it not justified here? Uh, what further information would you like? How can I improve my 
uh, my referrals information part for next time. And they, they'll really, they will be helpful on that. So in order to get your scan vetted and done first time, just check with your senior. And if you don't understand anything, check with them again. See what you're looking for, what scan they want, because there's nothing worse than actually getting the wrong scan for them. And we've all done it. So don't, if that happens, don't worry either. But it is a little bit embarrassing. You have your tail between your legs. Um, make sure you put enough clinical detail, including the relevant patient background, but state the scan that you want and what you're looking for. So I would like a, a CT abdomen and pelvis, query perforated viscous, query intra-abdominal sepsis. You know, that's intra-abdominal sepsis, just as a, a side note, is quite a good way of getting a CT. It's a good little phrase to check in there. That's bad habits. <laughs> but just say, that's, that could be bad habits, but we do get scans vetted now. Um, if rejected, ask the, ask the radiologist if there's an alternative scan that would be more appropriate or, or what they think. Quite often they'll just say, decide clinically. But I think when you're starting off, it's the best thing to do is speak with your senior, the consultant, or if the consultant's not available, speak with the registrar and they will, at the beginning, will be so helpful and give you all information that you, uh, they will help you get a scan and then you can just um, learn from that and take it from there yourself. Now onto the actual bread and butter of the job. It's discharge summaries and TTAs, which is to take away medication, I believe is what it stands for. But who really knows? It's also called TTO, isn't it? Sometimes they call it TTOs or the pen or what. Oh, to take yeah. away, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so our top tips for TTAs, okay. Referrals and scans are generally more urgent. However, the pharmacy does close at five. And if a patient can't go home because their medication isn't ready and the summary of information for their inpatient stay hasn't been done, they will be pretty annoyed because people don't like staying in hospital mostly. And also the medication, even if you do the TTA first thing in the morning, it has to be processed by the pharmacy, mm. then ordered, and then it has to arrive to the ward. So sometimes, especially if the patients need transfer or they're going to a nursing home, so it's good practice, of course, manage unwell patients first, do your referrals, do your scans, but just get the TTAs done quite early in the morning. Yeah. And uh, at our hospital and quite a lot of hospitals, you can do the TTA part, the medications part, separate to the summary. And because that's the bit that takes time, perhaps you got medications wrong or they don't have a certain medicine in stock and they need to get it from a fridge somewhere in the hospital. That's the bit that's worth doing first and then coming back and do the summary information afterwards even though it can seem a bit non nonsensical to do it that way. Um, pharmacist always checks over a TTA, but just to make the pharmacist's life easier and your life easier, um, you can just check with the register whether there are any medication that we want to stop on this shot or whether there's sometimes, for example, surgical patients will be started on omeprazole on a high dose. And then that's because we think there's one potential diagnosis, but then it changes throughout the course of their hospital stay. So they might not need a omeprazole on, on discharge. So it's important to speak to your registrar, but then also pharmacists are a really useful um, source of information. Mm. Another thing is uh, like antihypertensives. Quite often they'll be stopped in hospital because of AKI or something, and then the blood pressure stays low and you're thinking, should I restart this on discharge? that's when we can refer to our last point here and you can just say to the GP, would you mind in say a month's time checking this gentleman's blood pressure and seeing if it's still low, if not hold the antihypertensives, otherwise please restart them. And that's reasonable because the GP, this discharge summaries take a while to get to the GP and there's a pretty much a, a, a GP crisis happening at the moment where they're totally understaffed and they don't have enough people to action the jobs. Uh, that needs to be done for all these patients being discharged from hospital. So just don't forget about the GP. Don't ask them to do stuff at, at too close a time interval. Um, in terms of doing the discharge summary itself, try to keep it really simple and structured. You don't need to do a narrative review of why the patient was in hospital. I find the most useful and the, the best TTAs to read are the ones where they list the issues just like you did in the ward round 
and they show you the treatment that they action for each issue. And that way the GP can look through it very quickly. Uh, if the patient submits into hospital in future, then the doctor's clerking can look at that discharge summary very quickly because you'll find when you're on take, it's a very useful resource to have a discharge summary and a TTA that was done from a previous submission. So we, we've just included a, a really quick example from that diabetes case that we were talking about earlier. So it starts, dear doctor, Ms. James was admitted to this hospital on this date with abdo pain, nausea and vomiting. She was seen and treated as follows for these issues. One, two, three, it tells you exactly what they've done, all the investigations and the relevant results, the antibiotics and the treatments. IVI just stands for IV fluids, by the way, that's worth bearing in mind when you, when you start in hospital. And they've just said, we'd be grateful if the GP could check an HbA1c in three months time. Uh, she'll be followed up with this routine endocrine follow-up. She was medically fit for discharge on this day. And you can see how, how quick that is to actually write rather than going through all the notes laboriously and constructing the paragraphs and paragraphs of endless writing. So it's a quick way to do things and we highly recommend it. So at the end of your working day, there are just a few things that you have to quickly swizz over and make sure you've done. And that will be chasing the bloods, um, making sure that anything urgent has been actioned. And that might be like large jumps in uh, CRP, um, particularly if, if anyone becomes unwell at the end of the day, they develop a high new score. It's important to alert your seniors to that at the end of the day. And then you've got the handover as well. So any bloods that aren't back, any scans that aren't back, that aren't back or anyone you think needs seeing in the evening because they're unwell, you must hand it over to the ward cover. And the ward cover will generally operate from five until around 9.30 or nine, whenever, that, whenever the handover is for that evening. So the handover itself, just remember, hand over to others as you would like to be handed over because it's very easy when you get to the end of the day, just to, especially after you've got everyone's number, just message your mate like, hey man, can you just, can you just chase these bloods for this patient in this bed at the end of the day? Don't do that. Don't do that. It's not kind thing to do because you've told them nothing about the patient. You've not told them what you want them to do if they see that these bloods are raised. Remember, they don't know who the patient is. And so when you're doing a handover, we would really encourage you to do it like this. Tell them the patient name, the bed number and the ward that they're on, and then give them the unique patient identifier so that if it's something like chase this blood, they can do it from anywhere in the hospital. Give them a brief relevant handover about the patient. So this patient has type one diabetes and they were admitted with DKA. Tell them the job for your colleague. So she wasn't eating at lunchtime, uh, it would be great if you could start the subcutaneous insulin once she's eating at dinner time. And then if it's something like, a, say, a scan, it's important that, give them, that you give your colleague a plan for what to do if the result is normal, as well as what to do if the result is abnormal. So if the ultrasound this evening is fine, you can just leave it, nothing further to do. We'd really appreciate if you could just document that the ultrasound was normal because some other team needs to see the result. If the ultrasound is abnormal, we'd really appreciate if you got in touch with the surgical team because you might need something, a lap coli. Um, also, on, if you're on the other side, so you're the person who's receiving the handover, um, make sure you ask questions because after the handover is finished, the person who knows all this information about the patient is gone. So it's really important to be an active uh, participant in, in the handover. So make sure you, if somebody misses the information on, for example, what to do if the scan is abnormal, um, just bear in mind that what we included here is the basic information that you need. And also, um, if you have any concerns about a patient, it's just important to ask um, whilst you're being handed, um, handed over all the information, because then it just makes it a bit tricky when this person has gone home um, and just makes your job harder and you might receive a lot of um, a lot of things to chase, a lot of things to do. So it just makes your life easier. And also if you're the one who's handing over, um, at the beginning it's a bit tricky to decide what needs to be handed over. Of course, as Ben said, 
blood there, not backs, can results that need to be chased. That's all kind of self-explanatory where the patients were and well. But at the beginning, I think it's a good practice if you're not sure what to hand over. And that's also being kind to your colleagues who, when they start doing their ward cover and their on-call shifts, um, they, like I found it at the beginning, we're handed over a lot of so things. So much stuff. Then we wouldn't ask enough questions. And then the result comes and you're like, okay. And sometimes if, the notes. <laughs> if, if you show your sheet of all the jobs that have been handed over to your reg, for example, who's on with you for the evening, yeah. you might just go through the list and cross loads of stuff off. I mean, the things are not important. No, obviously only the things are not But they're, important. they're good for, yeah, they're good people to ask for help. And also with the TTAs and distro summaries, I, we haven't mentioned that. Whilst you write, when, after you write them, you can ask for feedback. So you can go speak to your reg, speak to your SHO and ask them what they think about what you, what you wrote and then give you some tips on how to improve quite useful okay so most of the time uh, you're going to be on the wood and you're going to be very well supported um during the day there's loads of stuff um that will be there at your disposal um when you're on call um you'll be supported as well there'll be people who will be who'll be there all the time available for uh, for you to um answer any questions but those shifts are much busier usually and um, they are sometimes um, stressful and challenging but you will get through them it will be okay in some of the hospitals um, those include night shifts um, weekend shifts where you either look after the ward patients or when you do the take shift so you see the patients in a &E. so all of those are are called um, on-call shifts so you will be carrying a bleep um, and when you start your shadowing period, you must um, learn how to how to use the bleep, how to respond, how to bleep out of people. But we'll get to that in a second. Um, so you have to um, just get a sheet of paper and make sure you write down all the numbers. Um, so all the calls they get by your bleep, sometimes you might get a few in a row. So it's important to write down all the bleep numbers and then go through them and just call them back one by one and write down all the information um, that they told you, um, that, they, that they tell you. And having said that, because you'll be bleeped a lot, it's important to remember that not all the patients need to be seen. Um, and sometimes patients need to be seen straight away. So in order to make it easier for yourself, you have to ask a lot of questions because the nursing team is there with the patient they can see the patient, they have the drug chart, they have their news score, they know what the observations are, they know the latest blood work, they know why the patient came to the hospital. So sometimes, um, it, I mean, most of the time, it makes your life easier if you ask questions whilst you're on the phone with the nurse. Um, you can also um, give the nurse some verbal recommendations or verbal orders. So for example, if the nurse calls you about a patient who has low blood glucose, and they are conscious, and they're responding, but their blood sugar is low, you can ask them to give the patient some glucogel because that will bring their blood sugar up straight away. So you can ask them to give them the glucogel and you can tell the nurse that you're going to be there in five to 10 minutes, but please give the glucogel and repeat the, the blood glucose in X amount of time. If I'm, if I'm not there, um, just please bleep me and tell me what the sugar was after giving the glucogel. Um, if that's the same, if they're calling you about a patient with very low saturations, you can ask them to put the patients on the high flow of oxygen and just make your way there. Um, it's also important to let them know when you're going to talk to them and just to make your life easier and the reviewing the patient um, quicker, just ask them for all the relevant information. So when they beep you, you know you're busy, you have a lot of patients. Just ask them to gather all the relevant um, documents. So ask them to get the draft chart ready. Ask them to repeat the set of OBS, ask them to um, get a medical notice. It's three or if the new score reaches five overall. So sometimes they will just bleep you and say the news is five. You'll go, oh gosh. But it might be that, say, the news score's been five all day. Or sometimes they'll bleep you and say the news is three and it's because the, the rest rate is 28. But you look at all the other robs and it's absolutely fine. 
So just make sure you ask them because quite often if they do that, they won't have the other odds there. And then you hear from them and you actually hear that the patient just got out of bed to go for a wee and it, it's not as serious as you think. So uh, yeah, asking questions is the most important thing there. And it will come come with time that you'll feel more and more comfortable. You know which questions to ask as well. But of course, if the patient is unwell, you have to you have to see them straight away. And sometimes you have to think about putting an emergency call. But we'll get to that later. Um, some essential apps that will help you when uh, you're on your on call shifts um, are as follows. So the induction app. I think they might not have it in every hospital. Most hospitals. Most hospitals do have induction app and it has all of the important phone numbers, bleeps, extensions um, to all the specialties. Um, if you need to refer to anyone, call anyone, call x-ray, call microbiology, call an SHO from some other team, it's all in there. It's very useful. And a good tip with induction is that if they ask you to contact another hospital, you can contact them from the induction of that other hospital. So each hosp hospital has an account. So say I want to, say I work in St. Mary's and I want to contact Chelsea Hospital, I can go on the Chelsea input for induction and find all the contact details on there. And it's a really quick and useful tip instead of going through your own switchboard, then going through their switchboard and then finally getting to who you want to talk to. And bear in mind, you have to listen to a 90 second coronavirus message every single time you call a hospital switchboard. So that's one of the apps that makes your life easier. BNF, I think you would have used um, throughout medical school. It just gives uh, gives you information on all, um, all the medication, dosing, um, contraindications, renal dosing, uh, interactions is very, very useful. And just use it during the ward round when you have to prescribe everything, just to double check if you're correct about the dosing, and then that will help you learn what, what those doses um, of commonly prescribed medications are. Um, each hospital or each trust will have um, their own local antibiotics guidelines, so that's very useful whilst prescribing antibiotics. Um, MD calc is useful when you have to um, calculate scores. So, for example, um, if you need to calculate creatinine clearance or if you need to calculate patient's Glasgow score. Or well score, like no one ever 65 well score. score. <laughs> so it's all in there. So if you ever have to calculate something, it's probably on there. Um, iResas is a useful app which gives you all algorithms for resuscitation, for arrest calls, para-arrest calls, um, for arrhythmias for um, patients who are acutely unwell. <clears throat> so that's very useful. Um, Pocket Doctor is an app that I think you have to pay for um, and it's not supported by the newest um, iOS system, which I came to realize the other day, very sad, but was useful. It gave you um, some tips on what to do when they uh, bleep you with some common presentation. So, yeah, abnormal news score, electrolytes. Yeah, but electrolytes is good for. You can find all of it on Mind the Bleep website. So very useful. Okay. Um, so sometimes um, you might feel like you're stuck um, and you might get frustrated and sometimes being an F1 is emotionally draining and there are loads of things that can... It's just difficult. It's a bit different to being a student. And there are a lot of things that you have to juggle at the same time. But having said that, um, other F1s who are working with you, they're probably going through similar things, even though your experience is very individual. Some problems are common. So people might be frustrated with um, their scans being rejected, with working late, or with their communication with the senior. So, some things are just common. So if you feel like you can share it with, with other FY1s because they're probably going for a similar thing. Um, your SHOs, as we did say before, they're your port of call <clears throat> uh, on the ward. They're always there to support you. They have recently done, they have recently been through what you're going through now. Um, so they're very useful as a first port of call. Uh, you always um, can get support from your clinical and educational supervisors. And so it's important to schedule meetings with them, the beginning of placement meetings early on, um, because then they can guide you throughout the placement. And if you have any issues, they're always there to, to help you. 
and they also are very useful to help you with um, updating your portfolio, explaining of what has to be included in your portfolio, how to um, make sure everything is signed off. So that just makes the, the progression through FY1 easier. Um, the MDU, as we did mention before, um, if you, I mean, you will need an indemnity cover. So if you have not signed up uh, yet, please sign up uh, to the MDU. We'll provide the link later. Um, they're also very useful um, when you have to deal with any complaints, which hopefully won't happen, but if it does, they're there to help. And we had a very useful talk on it last week, which you can find on the Mind the Bleep page. Uh, the BMA is another um, organization which is very useful, and especially now that you would have uh, received your rotas and your salaries, you can um, use their service called the uh, BMA, I think it's a rota, rota check. Um, they go through your um, hours, so just send them your rota, and they tell you if um, the working hours they have been assigned are safe. Right. Um, just some quick tips on uh, on a surgical rotation. Um, if you are surgically inclined, but even if you're not, it's quite interesting probably to to scrub in. Um, the seniors are usually very keen to teach you. Um, if you scrub in and assist, they'll let you do. Um, some knot tying, some suturing, you'll get to um, see some cool procedures. Um, the post-op care is probably what you're going to be more involved in as an F1 on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's quite useful to um, get, get to know what the common procedures are. So if you're on the upper GI rotation, for example, there are probably going to be loads of gallbladders, mostly gallbladders, actually. Um, so knowing what the complications are or um, what the post-op uh, care for the patient is, um, is quite useful. Um, knowing when to stop and restart medications very up is so important as a surgical F1 because you always forget. So again, you could probably, actually there is a script module on that. So you can do a script module, you can Google it, you can ask a senior, you can ask the pharmacist because different medications will need to be stopped um, in advance before before the surgery, but this is just something to bear in mind. Um, the drains are sacred. Never take the drains out. You must never take one out without a consultant saying, not even a senior, it must be the consultant who did the operation. Yeah. The, the thing that you are allowed to do with the drains is uh, look at them, <laughs> see what the see what, no, see what the indication is, because that's actually quite important. See where they are, because nurses tend to label the drains if there's more than one, they'll label it A and B, for example. But it might be subdiaphragmatic and they might be a pelvic drain so it's important because your your job would be to document what's the output in the drain was the color of the fluid um so you just need to explore um the drains and why they were placed in the first place um again some commonly prescribed drugs as a surgical one you will always be prescribing prescribing um analgesia antiemetics laxatives um, so it will come with practice, so you don't have to worry about that, but these are just common medications to be aware of. But do remember your WHO pain ladder, like it, it never gets, it never gets any more complicated than that. Yeah. Start with paracetamol, paracetamol plus NSAIDs, if it's indicated the patient's not too old or their kidneys are, their kidneys are fine, something like that. And then with strong opioids on top, it, that is it, that is all there is to it. Yeah, sometimes it's more complicated, but who pain ladder is there at your disposal. Um, and during the surgical rotation, um, making sure you know what the patient's eating and drinking status is, and in some uh, specialties, weight bearing status. It's so important because patients need to be fasted six hours before the surgery. So sometimes we don't know if the surgery is going to happen. It might happen, it might not. Patients kneel by mouth and the nurses call you and ask if the patient can eat. And you're not sure if the surgery is happening or not. And you say, you tell them that the patient can eat and then the consultant calls you half an hour later to ask to send the patient dancers for surgery. That's hard. Okay. Just say no. If you're not Always sure, say no. say no, and then check later. Yeah. So if the nurse is asked if the patient can eat, no, just check. All right. Um, we're almost, almost done. I feel like we have covered a lot of things. So if you want to listen to it again later, that is okay. Also, if you want to listen to it after you have actually done the job that is okay as well <laughs> because i feel like you live and learn and then you have a different perspective um after you have worked a bit um 
but some things to be aware of now, which will make your life so much easier. Because when I started, for example, and they said, I have to take time off, have to book my annual leave. I was like, why? I just want to go to work and learn everything. No, rest <laughs> is really important. Um, and also everyone will be requesting their leave. And in some trust, you have to do it six weeks in advance. So it's important. As soon as you know, um, we actually tend to request all the days as soon as the rotation starts, but some people do it differently. But if you just want to, if you know when you have to be off, just do it straight away. You're allowed nine days of annual leave per rotation. Additionally to that, you have self-development days. And for F1s, the allowance is now four days per rotation. And these are the days where you um, can work on your portfolio, can do any extra extracurricular stuff. That's the aim. But you can do whatever you want. As of this year, it's mandatory. So yeah. if they don't give them to you, it's illegal. So yeah. make sure you get them. It's also worth bearing in mind that it's illegal for them to give you set dates for annual leave. So if your road coordinator comes back and says to you, hi, Zara, I've booked you in for the 31st of October to the 7th of November, you can turn around and say, I'm sorry, that is not contractual. It's a very clear statement within the junior doctor's contract. So make sure no one's taking advantage of you from that perspective. And also once you start working, like you really want to have some time off. It's so good. Um, and that brings us to exception reporting. Um, so that should be explained um, at your induction, but you should be able to exception report. So report any hours that you had to work past your finishing time. Um, or if you have missed teaching, because you should have protected time for teaching and it's part of your um, obligations in F1 to attend at least 60 hours of teaching. So if you're missing teaching because of ward jobs, um, it's important to raise it and exception report. Um, and you, the trust gets penalized and they have to pay. So you get yeah, so paid for that which yeah. is not the most important, but you highlight what the issues are. So the, the point is that the trusts get penalized. So the trusts are a bit cross, but you get the money back as junior doctors. So you get paid some of it, but your guardian of safe working also gets paid some of it. So you get three eighths. The guardian of safe working gets five eighths. So just think about the money you save is actually more money for payday drinks and stuff like that. So it's really important to um, exception report. And if you ever get pressure that you're not supposed to do it, that is a GMCable offense for the consultant who is pressuring you not to exception report. So you can politely say that, or you can go straight over their heads and you can go to the guardian of safe working, tell them that you're get, receiving this pressure not to exception report, and they will make it right very, very quickly. Because the point um, of the exception reporting is to highlight the issues with the staffing. So when you accept from report, you have to tell them why. So you can say that I had to stay three hours late because there were a lot of patients, a lot of jobs, patients were unwell, and we were short of three doctors, for example. And if they see it coming from multiple doctors, multiple times, they do have to address that. All right. Um, also, sometimes things can get a bit challenging and you are encouraged to um, to engage in reflective practice. There is a um, there's a section on your ePortfolio when you are encouraged to write reflections. They can be private reflections, nobody has to see them, but you can choose to share them and they can then go through your reflection, discuss it with your senior and then discuss what has happened. So if something happens and you feel like um, you might not necessarily wanna to speak to someone um, at first, but it's quite useful to help you understand why your reaction has been, I don't know, why you felt a certain way. Um, so using the reflective practice is really useful. And um, even though it sounds really cheesy, but being kind to yourself goes a long way because it is difficult. And this is the first time when you have to work and you have to try to find time to socialize. And also now with COVID being around, um, and so many restrictions and so many pressures and so many extracurricular things, just, it's fine. Okay. Um, so your, one of the last chances to make it easy for yourself is your shadowing week, which I think has started for some of the F1s. Mm -hmm. We have F1s um, at our trust today. Um, so this is when you learn all those essential tasks, which we have mentioned. So the basics such as the bloods, the referrals, the scans, um, 
but also preparing the list. So some departments do it, loads of departments do, the departments do it in different ways. So just ask current F1s how to prepare the list, how to print it, how they normally do it. Um, use the bleep system, so learn how to bleep, how to respond to a bleep. Um, make sure you know what the numbers for the emergency calls are um, and know what those emergency calls are. So depending on a hospital, you'll have different calls. So you can have an, have an arrest call, it can be adult or pediatric, you have a peri-arrest call, you have a major hemorrhage call. So just know um, when to use those emergency calls and also particularly for the major hemorrhage, just know what happens when you trigger a major hemorrhage um, protocol. That's quite important. So know when you call, what you'll get, what blood products, who's going to come. That just helps you um, when you find yourself in this emergency situation. Um, uh a side note on emergency calls, if, if you feel you're out of your depth and you can't get through to someone, just put it out. Yeah. If, if you feel that, if you feel that far out of your depth that you're not sure what to do now, put out the emergency call because as we said at the start, it's the, the patient's care that's the most important thing. It doesn't matter if you, I, as a side, as a side note, I, I once, to cut a long story short, put out a uh, medical emergency call for what I thought was a STEMI, but turned out to be a uh, biliary colic. So you can't look more stupid than no, that. No, okay? no, but, no, but and, this is, no, but it's the thing. And it was Nobody... fine because I was yeah. worried and I put out the call and they turned up and they, they actually sorted out her biliary colic pretty well. And, and then they left again. No, that but also it. nobody's going to criticize you. So sometimes like putting so in at our trust is double two double two putting yeah, every trust every, every trust. trust okay so putting this skull in sometimes just feels like oh you're going to embarrass yourself or it's a horrible thing to do no if you're worried about a patient if you need extra pair of hands just put out the emergency call and you will never be shy to that um and also especially at the beginning when you come across an unwell patient you will have to do your ATU assessment. You'll have to escalate straight away and you have to do request investigations. And there are so many things you need to do. So if you feel out of your depth, um, you feel like it's better to put an emergency call rather than try to get through to a register, just put out the emergency call. And nobody's going to um, hold it against you. All right, but try to have fun as well. Um, so... <laughs> It makes the job so much easier um, and there should be plenty of opportunities to do fun things, loads of activities. Um, you can get involved if in wards, team social, uh, in your um, ward team socials, um, but also subscribe to the mess, pay the mess fees. That's very important. Yeah, it's rude not to pay the mess fees. Um, that just goes straight from your paycheck. It's about £15 um, it's per month, but it's very useful. We both um, did the mess, mess. the Just. mess is good. The mess is noble. Um, but yeah, if you if you want to get active involved, then you can apply for mess committee positions. Um, there are loads of them, and you can be very involved or involved just a little bit but that helps with socializing and uh, there'll be loads of events as well hopefully organized by the mess but maybe this is why you should join so um, they payday, can payday drinks is like a given at all trust so don't worry yeah I mean not all trust but that's the idea. Sure. Um, and uh, you can be very knowledgeable and um, you can know how to manage the patients in theory mm -hmm. but it's always good to be nice to everyone um, the nurses and the colleagues, if you get, if you find yourself in, in a bit of a pickle um, or you need advice on anything, if you're nice, the nurse and your colleagues, they will go out of their way to help you. Um, with the patient's relatives, the miscommunication or doctors being perceived as rude is one of the most common cause of complaints. Be nice and explain everything. It does help a lot. Um, be nice to yourself. We have covered that. We can't cover it enough. Um, and if you have to work with, um, if you're faced with difficult colleagues, um, just make sure that if you feel bullied, this is addressed because this is completely unacceptable. So final tips. We're almost done. Um, My top tip, I'm going to say, is flattery will get you far. We, we already sort of covered it with being nice to everyone, but even going out of your way to give people a, an extra smile, to 
say on your first nights you bring in some snacks as well it, it is gonna do you no end of goodwill okay and it, it carries so far you have no idea how difficult nurses can make your night shifts and how easy they can mm. make them they can do so much and they won't let you know until they trust you they like you and they don't think you're an arrogant little what's it yeah and also they the nurses have been there for so long a lot years of nurses are so mostly. senior and we just rock up there every year and we're so new <laughs> and just be nice um yeah nurses do love chocolate they love any kind of snacks in fact uh i think it's fair to say that snacks the way to the nurses hearts i mean i think for everyone the probably everyone within the nhs but yeah. it does get you far um always escalate early if you're worried about something just use your clinical acumen if you think it's not going the right way and there's anything that worries you the patient looks unwell get it in early get it up to a reg level okay because the sho can only take you so far and also in terms of planning because now you'll be very busy trying to find your feet organizing all of those um clinical and educational supervisor meetings and trying to figure out how to be an f1 um but once the dust settles a little bit um just try to get involved in audits or quality improvement projects because some of them take a while to um to get completed so it's usually a good idea to reach out to your registrar or your shos most of the time they will be working on some kind of an audit or a quip although have an idea on how to start one and that's very very useful for your portfolios and also does um improve the the patient flow patient safety at the hospital and and if you want a really easy free quip certificate that will get you signed off for quip for your arcp you can do that uh referrals form that we had earlier in the presentation and we'll get you a certificate for that mind the bleep certified one um and also the portfolio actually has quite a few things they need to cover it's very useful and it does provide a framework for your practice and what you're expected to do and help encourages the, the reflection as i've mentioned before but there's quite a lot of things to go through um so it's really important to start updating your e-portfolio early and working on it regularly and also during the first meeting of your education supervisor make sure you go through all the parts of the portfolio and then also uh, learn how to map your evidence to um the requirements that's important but, yeah. but realistically everyone does the curriculum mapping the day before your arcp i don't but it's okay. <laughs> um get involved in teaching um teaching medical students teaching in your department so running a journal club um, or doing any kind of didactic teaching um, that is useful for your portfolio, but also teaching others helps you understand the material better. It's usually very rewarding and you can set up your own teaching program and that's um, helpful for most applications, be it INT or CST. Points being prizes, never forget that. Very useful, but not now. Just start with uh, small steps. And yeah, if in doubt, ask for help. I think this is, this is always, always true. It's always ask. Um, so we are going to scan the feedback form quickly, as in you're going to scan the feedback form. Um, we'd appreciate any feedback, be as specific as you can. Um, it's very helpful for us to, um, to improve the sessions in the future. It also improves our teaching. Um, but also for you, if you fill in the feedback form, you get a certificate for attending this session. So it's useful for your portfolio as well. So we'd appreciate any feedback. And we are going to move on to the Q&A section, which we have to run ourselves. So we have to move over here. So we have, um, we have some questions. Um, <laughs> already on the group um please keep them coming because we'll do the q a for for the next couple of minutes and hopefully answer any questions you might have um so the first question from yusuf is how early um or how late the tta can be done like very practical <laughs> so actually that's a really good point normally even though pharmacy closes at five to doing anything and pharmacists won't stay a minute after hours the latest time for a TTA to be submitted is 4.45 and it can take a good 
10 minutes to, if it's a really long one, it can take 15 minutes to get everything on there, make sure you've checked everything, all the appropriate doses have been started, et cetera, et cetera. So really the latest you could start one is 4.30. Yeah, but I'd, I'd say in general, just try to do them before lunch. Just try, because as Ben said, like some of them will take 15 minutes, but most of like most of them will be quick-ish. It's not a very long job. Mm. Um, so just getting it out of the way, it's very useful, I mm. think. So we got another one from Sreya. Uh, does it help doing an audit or quip in an area that isn't necessarily the specialty you're aiming for? Well, Let me move to the feedback before I take and scan it. That's, that's an absolute yes. You must do a quip in order to get signed off for your ARCP. That's in F1, you must do one, and you must do one in F2 as well. So yes, it does help. Career-wise, no, it may not help, but actually for almost anything, it doesn't matter what the, the subject of the quip is, the fact that you've done one is important for portfolios. And for example, the, the surgical portfolio that we're both working towards now, you need to have done a quality improvement project or an audit, audit project in which you've completed two cycles and then you presented the results at a regional or local meeting. So that's how you score the top point. So it's worth bearing that in mind going into the year so that you can work on it. All right, let's see if there are any other questions. Oh, what specialty do you guys want to go into? This oh, is a difficult yeah, chat about this all day. It's really hard. It's a it's a tough it's a tough balance between like quality of life so and then difficult. like doing something interesting and doing something competitive. We both want to do surgery. We're both doing um, academic vascular surgery rotation. So we have two surgical rotations: general surgery and vascular surgery, and an academic block in vascular surgery. So I think surgery is the is the, the direction um, and I think I am a bit torn between plastic surgery and urology at the moment with the emphasis on at the moment mm, yeah I'm probably I'm leaning towards ortho at the moment or gen surge I have a record of that now but uh, yeah who, who knows there if if anyone wants to get in touch with us about anything uh, any concerns any specific career stuff more than happy to have a chat yeah I'm very happy to help um i oh, yeah. yes a feedback link in there that's a good i idea. will put a feedback i normally no i would normally do i normally do put a feedback link because is it not possible to scan it is that the problem because now i can't do it but i can do it once we're out of here but that's true. okay we'll we'll post the feedback form in the comments yeah. afterwards we'll leave the code up now for another few seconds we will, yeah, yeah, I will, I'll post the link in, in a second. Do you have any other questions? I post all the links, the sign up for the webinars, um, the feedback link, the MDU sign up. Yes, all those links I will post here. They're coming right at you. Um, so if there are no other questions, I think we're going to uh, call it a day. Right. Thank you, everyone. Good luck next week. And please join us for the, the webinars next week. So next Wednesday, um, the next preparing for FY1 session. And on Tuesday, the finance medic series. Um, so hopefully that was useful for everyone. And I will post the feedback links in a second. Guys, you're going to smash it. Just remember, by coming to this talk, you've done more than most F1s will. Okay. So you're going to be great. Fill in the feedback link to, to get your feedback. Please do. Feedback. And certificate. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. And don't forget the quick project.